All right, Grip, welcome to Behind the Braves here in the Alumni Lounge. Glad to have you. Yeah, appreciate it, Mac. Glad yeah. to be here. Yeah, well, we get to see each other a lot um, with Fantasy Camp and Alumni Weekend, Alumni yeah. Sundays. You're real involved with what we're doing, so we appreciate you and everything that you're doing. And uh, people might not know this, but uh, you're nicknamed Grip. Right, and sometimes I'll say grip, and people are like, what would you call him? Mm -hmm. well, you I, actually said that when we were interviewing Greg yeah. Maddox in Vegas, and you said, I think it was Greg Maddox, and you said grip, and I actually, I didn't know. I was like, wait, who is grip? And I <laughs> yeah. meant to ask you, okay, so right. it, here he is. Here's grip, okay. Yeah, what's right. the story yeah. on that? Yeah. Well, um, in all sports, football, sport, uh, quarterback, baseball, I was a pitcher. In uh, basketball, I played point guard. So I had the ball all the time. So they called me grip. Oh, okay. <laughs> Can you palm That's a awesome. ball? I can palm a basketball. Wow. Maybe, maybe right now, Mac. You know, look at that big. I know man. you got some big paws there. Yeah, yeah. Can you dunk, or did you dunk in what time? <laughs> we all used to say we used to dunk, <laughs> <laughs> but I could dunk. Actually, five ten, about one sixty five. Back in high school, I could dunk, but um, that wasn't my expertise. I was a defensive guy, so I would go in and probably guard the best guy on every team. Yeah. For a quarter or two, and you know, put somebody else on him after I got tired. But uh, I was that defensive specialist, number six man coming off the bench. There you go. Well, you were that's some uh, that's some skills for and some vertical for you to get up at uh, your height. Man, I got hops. I know. Come on, man. I know. I'm an athlete. Hey, I heard your name this morning <laughs> on MLB. Can you believe that they're breaking out the Marquise Grissom uh, comparison? So they're talking about Murray, the kid that uh, just turned down the yeah. age contract yeah. and decided going to be a quarterback. I don't know how he's going to be a quarterback in the NFL, being five nine or whatever. But I guess if Doug, Doug Flutie can do it, he can do it. But anyway, they they were comparing. They were saying that he would be the type of player, center fielder, you know that. Um, and I guess uh, the guy from the Reds, the former GM Bowden, mm -hmm. was breaking out the Marquise Grissom. He felt like that he would be that type of a player. So hey, wow. you got some, yeah, comparing you to that's young quarterback from Oklahoma. That's pretty good. I didn't know he knew anything <laughs> about my quarterback and skills either. I tell you, say They're coming pretty good coming out of high school. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you were you were well. You just said it. I mean, you always had a ball in your hands, but you were you kind of had a choice to make coming out of high school, going into college as to which sport you're going to play. Is that correct? yeah? You you got back then. It was like you know, I went and tried out for the Cincinnati Red. I think Cam Bonifay was the scout back then, and um, I actually lied about my age. You had to be a senior, and I lied about my age. I wanted to be out there so bad. <laughs> and I lied and said I was 18 years old, and I actually was 17, 11th grade. And um, I went to the trial, and they picked the top five guys f to come out the next day, and I was one of those guys. And I had to admit at that day that, hey, I got one more year of high school left. And so Cam Bonifay pulled me to the side. He said, tell you this, you go home, you do 100 sit-ups and 100 push-ups every day. Expect to see you back here again next year. And next year I went back. Cam Bonifay had to try it up at Southwestern Cab College. And I went and tried out, and they drafted me out of high school. Wow. Mm. And back then, $25,000 was a lot of money. And um, I went home and told my parents they, they wanted to draft me out of high school. And she was like, you ain't going to no military. <laughs> 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 You're not going to no military. And I said, Mom, it's not, it's not the military. It's baseball. And they're going to give me $25,000. In an instant, she was like, where's that? <laughs> and that's how we were back then, man. It's like I wanted to take those $25,000 then and go play baseball. Yeah. But um, baseball was that one sport that challenged me. I thought I could play football at the next level. Division one college football, I really thought I could. And uh, but when I got offered that money out of high school to go play baseball, something clicking like, okay, go where you can do both. So Florida and them offered me an opportunity to play both football and baseball. And just like a little small brat, I got down to Florida and them. I seen the football team. It didn't look like when I went to you know Purdue University on a visit, or when I went to Auburn down there, and that was a totally <laughs> different brand of football. Yeah. And I just thought about, it. I said, you know what, I'm gonna just stick to baseball. And I knew I was, you know, could have been a, a start on that football team at Florida a &M, But uh, you know what? I decided, I said, you know what? I'm going to go out here and just stick to baseball. So I started right then, went straight down to the baseball field, started getting the batting cage together, getting the field together to start baseball practice. And I was down there by myself for the first month and a half. That yeah, was probably a good experience. <laughs> I know why you like cutting hay now. <laughs> Florida a and M, right? I, hey, I learned how to work early in our household, man. Fifteen of us. I bet. <laughs> yeah, you had I bet. seven brothers and seven sisters, and you, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. What was that? Was 
what was it like growing up in that kind of I, did that make did growing up with that many siblings make you that much more competitive in life you think of or, course yeah of course I'm, I'm i'm number 14 out of 15 wow so you might my, the baby of the family in the girls section she's older than me two years older than me so i kind of got it from both ends from all the boys and then from all the girls you know, it was a beat down every day. I couldn't watch cartoons. <laughs> she wanted to watch soap operas. And, you know, the two youngest in the family, me and my brother Antonio, we did the bulk of the work growing up. And we did the babysitting in the family. You know, we did all of that stuff. And uh, you couldn't go out and play any sport and do none of that stuff until you did your homework mm-hmm. and stack that wood on that porch or cut that grass or fed the pigs and the, and the cows. You couldn't do none of that stuff. And, and that's where I think I got the discipline and the focus from at an early age where – other kids out having a good time. I'm working at home on the farm and trying to survive mm-hmm. each and every day. And uh, thank the Lord for my great parents who, who really um, raised 15 kids and 38 nieces and nephews Man. with um, a job from Ford Motor Company. You know, And my mom was a housewife all her life, so they did an extra job of raising all of us. That was a serious job she had. Yeah, I don't know how she did it, but, but she did. Well, it probably made you appreciate the time you did get to go out and play pickup ball outside with the neighborhood kids, or you got to go out and play. You know, you tell the story about the guy who who um, picked you up and to start yeah. taking you to practice. And, and I love the story about McDonald's and stuff. And I know R- Ricky wants to hear it too. Talk mm-hmm. about when you threw the car, you threw the rock at the car. Yeah, man, that's that's how it all started for me. I'm seven years old, man, and we out in the middle of the road playing uh, stick ball, and we playing with a broom handle, and we got a little small little ball bigger than a. Uh, the inside of a rubber ball of a uh, baseball and put tape around it and wrapped it up and made us a little baseball. And um, it's one way in our neighborhood, one way out. So whenever a car would come down the road and disturb our game, we all had a pile of rocks on the side of the road. Everybody had their <laughs> own pile. And we would rock the car. If it didn't come through fast enough to, you know, to get us back on the, uh, in the street to play our game, we would rock the car. And on uh, this particular time, the guy cruising down on a big old Cadillac, and he's just taking his time and, we get out of the road nice and easy, and then reach over there. Everybody going to standing beside their side of, of their pile of rocks, and we just can't wait. So to go out the neighborhood, you had to go down the street, then up a hill. So in the, in the fork of the road right there is a house. So my job for me, I knew I had the strongest arm, so I would throw the, I would wait to the car, make the turn, go up the hill, and I would try to time it and throw it over the house so he couldn't see me throw <laughs> and time it so it, <laughs> it would hit his car. <laughs> <laughs> so I would wait to the very end, let everybody throw, and I don't really think they wanted to hit the car. I think that was just the evil in me wanted to see how far <laughs> I could throw this rock <laughs> and try to time it to hit that car. And, and I was pretty good at it. I actually did a bunch of times, <laughs> not just one time. And this particular time, he went up the street, and I and I just waited, and I waited, and I held the rock, and all of a sudden, everybody listening for the sound, it goes ding, ling, ling, and it hit the car, and all of a sudden, the car come backing down the hill. He backs down the hill. He's come back and he's run to some of the guys that he see and, and asked them to come here. And me, I can't run into my house. My house is directly across the street. <laughs> my dad is in the back working on Morris. He's 6'5", 280. <laughs> 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 so anyway, I'm crying tears because I see them down there talking to the guy. and they're, they're, I know they're telling on me. I know they're telling <laughs> on me. <laughs> so here he comes. Here he comes. And all of a sudden, he comes to me and says, did you throw that rock and hit my car? I'm crying in tears. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> I did. <laughs> so he said, tell you what, where you live at? My dear. I make a deal with you. If you would come and play on my baseball team, I won't tell your mom and dad that you hit my car with a rock. And I'll pick you up every day. Bingo. That's a heck of a Bingo deal. for me. Yeah, so man. anyway, goes in the house, inter- introduce him to my mom and dad. I'm still in tears. And they, my mom and dad, they already know what's wrong with me because I done did this before. <laughs> 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 so they make the deal, and my mom and dad literally told him, if you can come pick him up every day and feed him, you can have him. Wow. Mm. So he did that for four years. That's how I got into organized baseball, and um, he pretty much – Stayed with me all the way through high school, through college, through my whole baseball career. No kidding. That's Thomas incredible. Wilson. Thomas Wilson. That's TJ. right. He just recently passed just away. Two years ago. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We uh, we got to hear the story at yeah. your fundraiser event. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's pretty powerful. And just to see his wife up there talking about it and talk about yeah. how much he cared about you. That that's a great story. Well, we we want to transition. Talk a little bit about um, 
what's going on with you now. Uh, this is Black History Month, so uh, we appreciate you coming on. We know you have or doing or that you're doing some great work in the African American community here in Atlanta. Hank touched on that on our last episode of Behind the Braves, and we know that he's been involved with you. I've seen him at, at your golf tournament. He came mm-hmm. to your fundraising event. Mm-hmm. But um, tell us a little bit about MGBA. I know you work for your wife, Sharon, um, <laughs> and uh, she's doing a great job with that, and she's keeping you in line. But um, but tell us just a little bit about what your focus is there, and then we'd like to talk, you know, just ask some questions about your perspective on some of the things that are going on in, in baseball. Yeah. Well, well, Mac, it's been 13 years ago we started MGBA, and solely because it give that um, – the, the kids in, in, in the African-American community, an opportunity to learn the game and play the game. So, you know, we talk about this all the time about um, kids getting an opportunity to play the game at the highest level. So uh, I, I, I truly believe there's three different levels of, of, of baseball. You've got rec ball, which I think is is pretty much eliminated now. Uh, and then you got you triple S A in the middle of the road ball. Then you got travel ball. So I've seen – this this wave and this change of movement of baseball happening, so I wanted to see what I could do about it. And for me, I wanted to um, not use the African American co- community, but I wanted to start in the African American community. You know, that's just one of my my location, but that's not the destination. Mm. So I want to be able to go in there, revamp fields, create an app, a, a safe atmosphere for these kids to have an opportunity to learn the game and play the game even rec ball at that level. But I had to jump in on the travel ball level to where I can kind of maneuver my way through to, to see, you know, how how do we get back to rec ball? How do we get back to every kid playing baseball or softball to its highest level, um, which may fit for that individual? You know, some kids are just sure. college college players. Some are just high school players. Some are just rec ball players but give each and every kid an opportunity to learn the game and play the game at its highest level for for them. Mm-hmm. Because we know at the next level, you know, they're going to fizzle out at 12, 13 anyway. But to create that atmosphere and to have every kid get an equal opportunity to learn and play. So in doing that over the last um, 13 years, uh, come upon now is in a good, si- good situation for us as an organization who really like to develop. We're in a development space to where – Teaching, teaching the kids the game, the baseball IQ, the financial literacy, the computer programming, the um, SAT, ACT prep, tutorial program, um, the, the whole thing, the one-stop shop where, where a kid can go learn. And I really think uh, just like the academies that, you know, MLB have in Dominican and Puerto Rico, I really just think every MLB team should have an academy somewhere. Mm-hmm. Somewhere. Mm-hmm. So – that is the big picture, but for me, being on the ground, being in that development space, I just know that there's that that's a place where I belong. I'm not a GM. You know, I just know I'm in the development space where I need to be on the field. I need to have not one kid. I don't do one lesson, two lessons. I want two, three hundred kids. I think that's the, I'm 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 that kind of person. I want to develop. I want them to get it. I want them to understand that uh, this game, baseball, that we all love, is a beautiful game. If you if you focus and if you're disciplined and if you're determined, you can, you can do anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it it's just goes beyond that's it's the life lessons beyond the field that you're teaching there too. I mean, it's just giving them a, a good place to learn how to grow up and be a a man or a a, a woman and a, just an adult, really. You know, just giving them a safe place to uh, to grow. And that's that's amazing. One thing I asked uh, Hank about, and I wanted to ask you. You know, sadly, in the last few decades, we've seen a decline in the number of African American ball players make it to the big league level and just playing the game at higher levels in general. What is the one thing, or what is is there one particular thing as an industry that we all need to be doing a better job of to to help that trend turn the other way? And I know this past opening day, we did see a, a little bit of a rise for the first time in a number of years, which is great. But how do we make that trend keep keep growing and keep keep growing higher and getting more young African American athletes playing baseball and eventually to the big leagues? Well, I, I really think the overall picture for me is to enhance the whole game. So if we if we were, were able to go back and have that, that reg ball like it used to be and have the proper coaching, which that will be the next step above, now we start to be- developing those kids at a young age, not just in the African-American community, but all kids enhancing the game. 
you know, our game has taken a shift and a turn with the saber metrics and the uh, analytics. That's fine. You know, we got to make that adjustment. You know, as as a group, we got to make that adjustment. So for our kids to make those adjustments and test well and understand the game, they have to have the information. They have to have a place to play. They have to have somebody to tell them because they don't know. And I went and went to the big leagues and coached one year in 2009 and realized I had two or three outfielders who didn't know how to field a ground ball. Mm. So you may get there with your bat, but we we trying to build a well-rounded student athlete. So we, we're not trying to produce any major league baseball players. Okay. We want them to graduate from high school and go to college. So that's that's our biggest focus now. We we know the kids that even though with the African American kids, even though the kids that are real, real, real good, they need it the most. Because I was one of those kids that were real, 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 real good and didn't know it. I'm just glad my parents <laughs> raised me the way they did and didn't have the big head and I'd walk around like I was that. I just was humble and kept working. But I had that coach who taught me how to field the ball at an early age, T.J. Wilson. Taught me how to act a little bit on and off the field at an early age. You know, crying in baseball. You know, you can't open the door for the lady. All that little stuff that they taught us along the way it's part of the discipline, it's part of the focus, it's part of the makeup. And when we have those kind of relationship with those kids, that's what set us apart from everybody. And I and that's that's what that's what we do. That's what we learned growing up with fifteen brothers and sisters and the family orientation or the family gathering and just like here in ninety five when we won, everything was together. You know, sure holds from top to bottom it was One cohesive it was, unit. It was just like that, and mm-hmm. and and nobody was going to beat us. We we knew what we were doing. We knew where we were going. So when everybody's working together, it's it's a different ball game. And the same thing with building the youth academies or building whatever we build or whatever we bring together, the pieces together. It has to work for everybody. Well, you're <clears throat> you're definitely building character in these kids when when I watch them especially at your events and I see them about not only the stuff that they're doing on the field but off the field they just they are they do seem like well-rounded young men and we know that the game of baseball teaches you so much more about life than it does just how to be a great ball player but there's things about adversity and and respect and and being coachable Mm-hmm. things that you need in the workforce, things that you need in life and in your marriage. And that's what I love about the game, being an athlete playing baseball, is that there's an endurance factor. There is a lot of things that just help you to become that well-rounded individual so that you can excel in, excel in whatever you're passionate about. And that's mm-hmm. what I love about the game. I love about your organization because you are working with these kids to to find some way to get to college if they're gifted athletically which a lot of them are, then then they'll probably get to go somewhere and play. But more importantly, they're learning life skills and, and you're passing along what somebody taught you, a coach took you under his wing, like you shared the story earlier when you were younger, and, and I see you doing the same thing. And, of course, you have a couple of boys still at home, and, and aren't they – and well, you got uh, DeMonte and mm-hmm. Marquise Jr., right? So Those they're both in the program, right? Tell they us are. how they're doing. Yeah, they well – um DeMonte is a, a, one of my oldest kids. He's 26, yeah, 26, March 30th. Wow. I'm trying to, I got to keep up with him, six of them. <laughs> <laughs> but um, great athlete, um, played high school baseball at Whitewater, um, went on to Tallahassee Community College and played and went from there to middle middle Georgia, you know, just, just searching for um, a way to get drafted. Hmm. Not understanding the process of got to go to school, got to go to class. And he's one of those guys that didn't want to go to class. He could not stand going to school. And I was pretty much the same way. But um, it's something just told me I got to go to college. I just, just got to go to college. Got to get out of here. Got tired of <laughs> slinging the wood in the backyard and <laughs> pulling water from a well, drawing water from a well, five gallon bucket, 105 feet deep. Do mm-hmm. that. Do that fifty times every morning at five, six in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> make, you have, to to college, no, make, make you want to go to college. Make you want to go to college. But anyway, he he did very well. Um, actually, his first year in college at 
Tallahassee Community College, he hit for the cycle. The first game. Nice. And I oh, told him, awesome. dude, it's all downhill <laughs> after that. It's he over. thought this game's easy. Yeah, it's <laughs> over. <laughs> and, 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 and I was serious. I'm like, dude, it's all downhill for real. He thought it was a joke. And eventually uh, he left there and coached clean house and he went to middle Georgia on scholarship and played there. And we had a conversation about just sitting about 300 bucks and he's driving to go to class. I say, man, that 300 bucks will last you, you know, at least a month and a half. He called me back within like 10 days. Dad, I need some more money. I said, dude, you can't be going to class. You can't be. And he was like, I hate going through those doors. I just hate it. <laughs> and I told him, I said, dude, pack the car up and come on home. Come on. And it's two hours, and I guarantee you he was at home an hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> he was at home that fast. And I said, I don't know what you're going to do with the rest of your life, man, but you you got to go. It's time to go. You're 21 years old. You got to become something. So he's been well invested into the program. You know, I'm still trying to get him to go to that next level. He could, he could scout. Uh, he probably worked with 10 or 15 major leaguers right now. He can be an agent. I'm just trying to get him to do anything that he wants to do. But right now he's trying to develop an app who's doing well. And uh, so he should be in the game of baseball no matter what. Now, the 17-year-old is at Counter Payne Montessori. He's a, at private school. He's doing well. He's accepted a um, – I got offered a full ride from Georgia Tech nice. as a pitcher. And um, 3.6, you got to keep that grade point average up to get in tech. And uh, he's on that technology, man, and that um, engineering. So – I'm happy about that. Wow, so good for him. All that hard work over all the last couple of years where I want to just beat him down, <laughs> beat him to death, <laughs> and fight with him, get him to work out, to run, to exercise, to eat right, to go to bed, you know, with everything that's going on with social media and what he wants to do, he's done a, one heck of a job of maturing the last couple of years. And that father-son relationship is great. And uh, he's driving now. I can back off and give him a little breathing room, but as long as he don't miss his workouts. Mm -hmm. So he's been on it for the last three and a half months where he haven't missed not one workout. So I'm just happy and thankful for that. That's great. I know we 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 talked to uh, Tom Glavin about his son playing at playing at Auburn and and Greg Maddox, his son. He's coaching his son at UNLV. And one thing I I asked them, and I'm curious to know from you as well, is with your son and coaching your own son. Do you do you wait for him to come to you? Like, if he wants advice specifically something baseball related, do you wait for him to come to you for that advice, or are you you're not shy about going right up to him? Like, you see something he's doing on the field, and you you're immediately offering advice, whether whether he wants to listen to you or not. Or are you which 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 kind of is your style with coaching your own son? Well, I um I had two older boys that I coached before that, so I gave him you know I gave but those two the option. I said, well, Ken Griffey Jr., you know, Brett Boone. Barry Buns and all them, I said, I heard the stories of, you know, Barry telling me his dad made him come down there and do it. Made him come down there and do it 2 o'clock in the morning. I want to hear that sound. I want to hear that sound in that garage. Don't you leave until I hear that sound. So I gave my kids the option, my two older boys, you want me to make you do it or you want to do it on your own? And I got one and, I got one, and one. So I didn't do either. I just spent them off on, my, on their uncle, Antonio, who's got all the experience in the world, and even with my son today, spent him off on Marvin and Antonio. They they got the experience and they got the knowledge. My key with my son is we're going to work out. I'm going to work out with you. We're going to throw together. I'm just want, I want to stay on the work. I want him to outwork him. I don't do none of that other coaching with the pitching. I don't do none of that. But we're going to run. We're going to exercise. We're going to eat right, and we're going to go to bed. So that's kind of like with him. That's what I'm doing. I just I don't want to be as I don't want to be as he don't need a coach. I didn't want no coach when I was playing. And to get him to be self sufficient on his own. Now I'm throwing some stuff at him like, hey man, be all right if you uh, you know he 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 goes off on me. He goes, you ain't do nothing. I said, well, I don't, you, ain't, you, ain't, you ain't do nothing. You, you, I, I'll strike you out. I said, okay. I said, what do you mean you didn't do nothing? He means in the game. Yeah, you saying yeah, that you, yeah, your right. stats aren't that yeah, good. Ain't that oh, good. Yeah. So I was like, you, you go look on the back of that card. I said, tell you what, <laughs> you want to be better than me, you be in the big leagues at 21. Yeah. Okay, do that. When you're a Cy Young by 25, do that. If you want, you want, you talk about I ain't do nothing. No, you do something. You ain't did nothing. So we go back and forth like that. But I'm trying to give him information that he's going to experience later on. I already done seen the success. I'm trying to 
to mentally stimulate mm-hmm. him and keep him working and keep him in check as far as his ego and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Great kid, and I love him. And um, it's just a good spot right now for me and him, <laughs> you know, to yeah. be able to – he comes in and get his work in. And, and I can tell by the weights in, in the weight room where he done went from 35 pounds to 95 pounds. Two oh. months. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. like – I get out of there. So when I see that, I go back upstairs. <laughs> right. Well, his first big challenge will be Georgia Tech. I mean, he yeah. he may not have been he he's probably not been challenged to this point if you really think about it. But yeah. his first big challenge is walking into the ACC. Yes. Working walking into a big time Division One program, seeing everybody like him. Well, I'd say sixty percent, forty percent of the guys will be similar. You know, his talent level. Mm-hmm. And he'll be challenged, you mm-hmm. know, and and that'll be the first test for him to see what kind of mental makeup he has. And so the stuff that you're doing is probably really good for him because he doesn't know what he doesn't know. Right, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> if you were doing just a scouting report on what kind of pitcher he is, I mean, what coming out of high school, what what kind of pitcher uh, do you think he is, or what style of pitcher do you think he is? He's trying to be a power pitcher, but um, you know, nine, eight or nine. You know, Andy May is a guy who uh, – I'll never forget this. Andy May is a guy who – he's that guy that had the independent league. If you done finish high school and college or in my league, you're trying to get back to the independent league. He was one of those guys that tried to get those guys at least back in the independent league ball, which I thought was very needed in the game of baseball. You know them guys on their last leg. Mm-hmm. And then got released or high school, didn't go to college, but but really good. Mm-hmm. And he would help those guys get the independent league ball. He took interest in Marquise Jr. and was trying to show him how to pitch. He came home seven years old. He got a YouTube out there when he was seven with a big old bat hitting. And then he had the little pitching video. He came home a week after that. I want to be a pitcher. I want to be a pitcher. And we started playing catch. Started putting targets up. And by nine, it was in the spots. Yeah. <clears throat> well, you might be a pitcher. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, I, I kind of left it on, and I kept watching ten, eleven, twelve, and okay, okay. Now let's hit. I'm trying to throw him off. We started hitting, and he just he was he was real weak on the lower half. So we just started building the lower half up to get him to understand how to use the lower half. Now he's really learning how to use the Lord. Have now Mac under control where because he got so much power. Now he trying to now he got to control that, mm-hmm. and c- he can continue to work. So that's how he learned it, learned how to pitch without anybody teaching him. So then of course we got him with Marvin and anybody else who you know with Flash had him, and I even wanted to get it with him because he threw he threw junk. <laughs> He I he threw junk. That he he was cheating. He was cheating. Him and Maddox were cheating. Right. <laughs> but it, you but know, that change but, up, right? But, but still, yeah. now it's all about the spin rate. That's mm-hmm. why. I, I, and I and I told Mac I wanted to get him with him seriously on that because his stuff was different. He got he got a good fastball. He got a two seam. He got a great change up, and he's working on the breaking ball. But to be able to mix some of that stuff that he had in that that he had. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. That's that's something that's something you you talk about a lot here on yeah. behind the Braves. I mean, you bring yeah. up your the, the change up and yeah. and you know how that kind of was the 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 major yeah. key to your career, really. Well, kind of if you if you listen to what they're saying now in the industry, the whole the holy grail is the spin rate, but they're always talking about how to increase the spin rate, which mm-hmm. makes the ball not decrease. You know, uh, you know, as far as gravity, the ball going down, the spin rate keeps it up a little mm-hmm. bit. So because they're all trying to hit that spot, you know, they're throwing mid. If you're right-handed, you get better throw mid, mid to upper 90s, mm-hmm. and they want you to hit that top of the zone. And in order to do that, you got to have the spin rate. And and so it, it, the ball, what we used mm-hmm. to say, would, like Smoltzy would throw, the ball jumped. Yeah. And it really, it's just an optical illusion. You know, the ball doesn't jump, but it doesn't go down as much as everybody else. So the ball stays higher in the zone, yeah. and it's tough to hit. Well, I was always trying to decrease the spin rate because I wanted the ball digging, and I wanted the ball going down. And back when we were pitching, the toughest pitch to hit was down and away, sinking, or, you know, the ball down the zone. And, and guys didn't – I think earlier, before that period of time, guys did pitch up in the zone more. Mm-hmm. And so the game evolves a little bit. So, I, I mean, I'm just predicting that as the spin rates, you know, 
right now they don't know how to increase the spin rate. That's just one of those God-given abilities to be able to do that. But even if you can't increase it, you can still pitch up in the zone. My prediction is when everybody starts pitching up in the zone and they start hitting that one spot where all the batting averages are bad, mm-hmm. they're gonna go, the hitters will adjust because hitters aren't that dumb. Mm-hmm. Right, they'll mm-hmm. adjust, and then all of a sudden they'll be looking for other ways. So the they'll show the statistics will show that well that batting average went from you know 189 to now 245. So we better find now we see that the ball down and away is now that's the zone where guys aren't hitting because the hitters adjusted here. They can't do both. So if they are hitting this now, then now all of a sudden we got to go back to that, and so they'll be looking for ways to to sink the ball. Maybe they'll still be throwing hard, but now they'll be looking for the hard sinker. And, and that's where the, you'll want to decrease the spin rate because you can't increase it, you know, and still hit that spot. You want to decrease it and then make the ball move and mm-hmm. sink. So that's a long, you know, answer to that. But that's really – I think if you can learn to do both now, then you're prepared for the next 10 or 15 yeah. years. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. I didn't mean that in a negative way. It ain't no, junk. I'm it ain't right, junk. Right. It's <laughs> filthy. I should have said filthy. Mm-hmm. Well, my yeah. nickname yeah. was Dookie, so yeah. I mean, you yeah. know. Yeah, he had, he, I, I didn't, didn't want to face him <laughs> at all. See, I, I'd heard the nickname was Harry, but that's, <laughs> yeah. that's, see, that was that's a couple of people have told me that. But you know, we all uh, have multiple nicknames. <laughs> it's apparently, yeah, apparently so. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, we uh, I know it's exciting to have your son um, doing well, and it'll be great to watch him. I've got a nephew playing up at Barry, and uh, just starting. He's a freshman, and I know it's exciting to uh, to possibly see him. Well, is he a junior or senior right yeah, now? Junior, junior. He's a junior. Right okay, so we got a couple years to go yeah. watch him watch him play. So. Uh, but it, uh, yeah, that's that's all good stuff. And yeah, I, I know I, I would be remiss. Just the fan side of me, the the little Ricky Mass that grew up watching you guys play in the '90s. Uh, I I, ha- I would have to ask a little bit, real quickly, just about the final out in '95, because that's just the fan of me has to ask. <laughs> um, I, I'm just curious. I've watched that replay a thousand times as a fan of of the, you catching the final out, and it's it's burned in my mind. Was there even a hint of, like, when the ball came off the bat, was there even a hint of extra nervousness because it was the last out, or were you instantly just like, I'm about to catch the last out of the World Series. We got it. It's no, over. I was locked in. Yeah. I was like, I know the, I noticed the ball was fading a little bit to left field, and it was like, that was my ball. And I was going for it, and it was, it was an easy catch. I already had visualized not me catching the last out, but us winning the World Series. I didn't care who caught the last out, but us win- I already had visualized us winning. And we had the we had the best team, best pitcher staff, best front office, best coaches. We had everything. And to be able to catch the last out, it was it was another play. You know, you you live for those moments. You know what I'm saying? That's what we play for. Mm-hmm. And but everything did go in the matrix. Now everything slowed down, and I was going <laughs> in slow motion. It looked like it wasn't gonna never come down, <laughs> but, but it came down. And man, I'm like, we just won the World Series. Not only that, I'm at home. Mm-hmm. Right. I grew up right down the street. Mm-hmm. And a thought, of, and a thought went in the back of my mind. Go ahead and retire now. And right. I was like, Nah, nah. I ain't gonna do that. Still <laughs> now too Smitty young. wasn't in left, was he? <laughs> no, it was Klesko. Smitty was over on the, yeah. on the foul yeah. line. <laughs> you had to catch yeah. it. Bobby used to tell me, Hey, you know Smitty out there, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> That's Dwight Smith. What, what was that like when you? Because coming off of '94, off of the strike season, you you were with that great Montreal team, but yeah. then you get traded to the hometown Braves. Was there any? extra pressure coming home or was it just all excitement you're coming home to play in the big leagues well it was extra extra pressure i just didn't see it till afterwards you know till probably after the 95 season you kind of go back and reflect i'm like dang trying to leave 45 i'm leaving 30 and 40 tickets every day that alone mm. was a headache for me and i'm looking back i'm like how in the world i do that no that i abuse the system I got, I got his tickets every day. I got everybody tickets every, right. every day. And I remember this quote that Eric Davis say. It was like, you want to see me play? You want to see me play? You got to pay. <laughs> <laughs> I probably should have told my family that, too. <laughs> That's good. Well, yeah, too bad you weren't married to Sharon back then. She would have she whipped all that oh, right in it, shape. It would have been in shape, dude. I'm telling you. It would have been in shape. Yeah. That's good. One, one last question for me. We want to be respectful of your time, but one, one, one more question about the, the, the last out. And I've read the story. I just kind of wanted to hear you tell it. Um, the, the, the ball, the last out, you gave it to a, a security guard at the stadium. And I just yeah. wanted to know that story and how that, how that came about. Well, it, it started when I first came to the Braves. So just a little short lady security guard. I didn't know her name. So, um, you know me, I just run out of the dugout, and I'm, and I'm speaking to everybody. I say, hey, shorty. <laughs> and boy, she lit into me. She was like, "My name ain't no name." 
like, wait a minute. I'm just trying to be nice and speak. So, <laughs> so, so over the period of from then on, this is the first game, first game of the season. So from then on, you know, we kind of develop a relationship, and I'll be like, you know, I may call a shorty, and then all of a sudden I just, I'm joking, and she'll be like, get your butt out there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, of course, um, you know, she kind of, we kind of clean together and all that stuff. So make a long story short, game six of the World Series, she told me, she asked me, said, give me that ball at the end of the game. That's enough said. She was like, you give me that ball at the end of the game. I want that ball when you catch the last out of the World Series game. I want that ball. And all of a sudden, I didn't even think anything about it. The ball was hit, and I caught the ball. I don't even remember giving it to her. And then all of a sudden, she reminded me that before I came in, I never jumped on the pile too late because I had to come. I'm the last one coming from center field. And I, I don't I know. Did. I might have been the last one. <laughs> <laughs> you might be right. You might be right. You might, and I flipped her the ball. And then all of a sudden, I got the ball back, and I signed it for her, and I was like, yeah, I, I remember now. I remember now. So, anyway, uh, we've been talking over the last um, couple of months. I'm actually meeting her Thursday to get the ball That's back. That's awesome. No kidding. Yeah. She's a sweetheart. Yeah, she, get, she awesome. gave it to her son in the military when he was in the military, sent it to him. He came back from the military, I want to say, seven or eight years ago. He gave it back to her, and she offered it to me. And I was like, nah, you keep it. And then um, – Something just inside of me was like, she offered to you again, get that ball. Yeah, yeah. And What's she your offered. Name? Gail? Faye. Faye, okay. I don't know her last name, but her okay. name is Faith or yeah. Faye. Faye. Okay. They're a little short lady. She yeah, used, she used to be big, with the Hawks. and she Big get, smile. Yeah. She was funny. Yeah, she was funny, man, but she feisty, boy. She <laughs> she, lit, she lit into me. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Because especially, I mean, the temptation for anybody, yeah. you know, to, to – well, just put it out there to make some money on something like that because that's obviously very valuable. It would be there, but if that's that shows you what kind of person she is to hang on yeah. to it and, and what kind of person she raised in her yeah. her kid in the military to give it back. I mean, that's that's yeah. incredible. What a cool story. I'm going to give her a little something for it. I'm going to give it. It ain't going to be free now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got to give her a little right. something for it. And I, but, but I appreciate the opportunity and think that she she's thought enough for me to give it back, you know what I'm saying, yeah. to even mm-hmm. offer it back. So um, I'm excited about it. Actually, like I said, actually, I'm going to meet her on Thursday and um, get the ball back. So I'm excited That's about it. That's incredible. Yeah. Well, it's been a blast having you on. Uh, we appreciate you sharing your story. We appreciate your passion for what you're doing. I think you're a great example to not only your kids but the other alumni. I know we have a lot of guys in our group that support you that are always there to come to the golf tournament and be a part of it. I, it's, I love, I told Hank this, I really appreciate him being involved in mm-hmm. what you're doing. And, you know, and he just said, well, you know, I, I do what I can at my age, but, mm-hmm. but it's just great to see him interested. And I know that, um, that uh, he appreciates what you're doing. And so it's good to see guys like Marvin Freeman working yeah. with you. Yeah. I know we have a lot of guys in the area, <clears throat> Dwight Smith and Terry Harper, Pete Smith, mm-hmm. guys that are still teaching and being involved in the game, and I just think that's 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 awesome. And so anything I can do, you know, yeah. we're here to support you, and yeah. just appreciate you being involved with the Braves alumni, and and uh, it's been a, it's been a real good thing. It's been good to see, and I know it's been healthy healthy for you. So thanks for coming yeah. on, and and uh, have to check us out on the on behind the Braves on the podcast, and then also mm-hmm. now on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Will do, man. I all appreciate right. you, man, and all you do for MGBA and what you do for the Braves as well, man. You've been keeping me in the loop over the years and um i just I'm, I'm still waiting on that partnership with mgba and the braves to make this thing happen man that's right with uh us in that development space and hopefully be able to atlanta atlanta deserves that mm-hmm. and uh the braves deserve that baseball deserve that and we'll get a chance to enhance the game all the way around the way it works for everybody man so i'm yeah. looking forward to that opportunity to yeah. make that happen and you know <clears throat> and that'll give us opportunity to bring you back on at some point because we are developing we're getting heavy into the you know the youth sports area with developing tournaments and t- mm. teams and working with groups like yourself so there's a lot more to come definitely on this topic and, and yeah. we look forward to that in the future yeah. absolutely all right man thank you so much appreciate Marquise. It. we really appreciate, appreciate y'all. it appreciate y'all having me man